welcome back to Alakapulco. We got Rick Valgvinger from the Swedish Pirate Party here. So Rick, um, the people who never heard about the Pirate Party in Sweden, maybe can you tell us about the Pirate Party in Sweden, please? We're essentially on a, on a mission to make sure that our kids have the same civil liberties as our par parents had. That's the in and outs of it. We should think our kids should be able to send an anonymous letter that is untracked. We should think they should be able to read a newspaper without the government knowing what articles they read, for how long and in what order. We think they should be able to walk through the city without every footstep being tracked and so on. It's not unreasonable to ask for. And yet when we do this, some people just go ballistic, in particular the copyright industry. Like, you can't possibly say that anybody should be able to send anything to anybody. We would go out of business. And, they, and I say, why would I care about your business? It's reasonable that our kids have the same liberties that are, as our parents. It ends with that. If you can make a business in the face of sustained liberties, you get to do something else. I don't care. Are you actually in Parliament, by the way? We are. We are on our second term in the European Parliament. The first term, we had two representatives from Sweden. This, this term, we have one representative from Germany, Julia Reda, who was elected from the uh, Deutsche Piratenpartei. Yeah, and um, so, and are you sitting in the Swedish parliament as well? We are not. We are not, unfortunately. We had a brilliant game plan, but another party executed it. So I'm sometimes saying that, yeah, th this party, they, they're, they ha their strategic and tactical game is brilliant. I know because I wrote the plan, only not for them. Like, um, we asked you before, um, like in, in Germany, like the... Piratenpartei, uh, how it's called in Germany. For me, it's more like a left-wing party. Like they are all like kind of Marxists and leftists. What are your thoughts on this? The pa uh, the Pirate Party is very special in its distribution. In that, if you're looking at most political parties, they tend to have a bell curve on the traditional left to right scale. Mm -hmm. As in, they peak at this particular point and then it tapers off in both directions, but the uh, Swedish Pirate Party and all other Pirate Parties, as far as I know, have the complete inverse, mm -hmm. as in we have very few mainstream people, we have very few boring people, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so from this bottom in the middle, it increases towards both ends. Mm -hmm. And in Germany in particular, and unfortunately, because the German Piratenpartei was doing very, very well, it, grow, uh, it grew very quickly became a victim of its own success and so since every member had a vote everybody was basically voting their own pet project onto the agenda it lost the sense of direction and, and it became a faction fight between these two extremes or n not extremes because that sounds that sounds negative but these two poles if you like and whether one likes it or not one pole won out over the other and that's where we are today. So the Marxist one. How? How? I I don't know enough about them to call them the Marxists, but I know that there were two factions again, and that what's generally considered left won out in the end. And how how is it in Sweden? In Sweden, the par the party is not in parliament. It is doing going through a sort of a rebuild phase mm. after um, having tried it wings with various concepts. I mean, my original hack of the parliament was based on getting a tiebreaker position in between two party blocks. Another party took that position, so it's now kind of hard to explain how you're going to get influence once you get voted in. You need both what you're going to fight for and how you're going to fix it. You need both of those. But the party in Sweden, I think it can be rebuilt, but it's going to take some effort. Okay. Um, was there a special moment for you to create the Pirate Party? What was that? Can you explain? There was absolutely one specific moment. But <coughs> since I'm a politician, I can't give a straight answer. <laughs> so <laughs> We totally understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so there were three major factors that led up to the founding of the Swedish and First Pirate Party. There was the software patents debate in the European Parliament, which we won now, which the Liberty faction, if you like, won very, very narrowly. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the European uh, Patent Office don't give a shit about what the European pa Parliament decided anyway, which is a tragedy in itself, but that's a separate topic. 
but we won that very narrowly, and that sort of alerted me to, hey, you know, maybe there's something that can be done on these issues. And then the next thing was, in the fall and summer of fall, and fall of 2005, downloading was criminalized in Sweden from unauthorized sources. And frankly, that's fucking not how you do it. When you're listening to a radio station, you're not a criminal if the radio station doesn't pay its fees because you don't have a clue and you're not supposed to have a clue. You're not supposed to need to have a clue. So this was such obvious, shameless mail order legislation from Disney, from the big copyright industry lobby that everybody was discussing it. I mean, it was discussed in workplaces, over coffee, at family dinners, at universities, in schools, you name it. It was discussed everywhere, except in one location, that was in politics. Politicians did not discuss this. And that really set me thinking, like, how can they be so blind? Like, politicians are usually the first people to notice when one single topic is discussed everywhere. And they were just completely blind to it. So that set me thinking, like, how can you make them notice this? And I was thinking, maybe you can't because it's a blind spot they have. And you're not getting on this, you're not getting on their agenda because they, they're seeing this as an eight to five job, yeah? You're just gonna be a random lunatic in between those guys who want a hamster tax to fight carbon dioxide and those guys who want to tear down the bridge that shouldn't have been built in the 1970s and which they never really got over. Mm -hmm. So you're not <clears throat> gonna get on their agenda the ordinary way. Maybe you have to make it personal for them. Making something personal usually works. Maybe you should aim right at their power base. You should kick, you should maybe not kick them out of office, but you should make it plausible that you could kick them out of office if they don't shake the fuck up. So that was the threat you were posing. Yeah, exactly, to the exactly, system. exactly. So those were the first two so kind of things that set me thinking, if you like. I did the math. I realized that, yeah, you need 225,000 votes to get elected into parliament. And then the magic insight. We can do this. Like, that was about one-fifth of the people file sharing in Sweden at the time. It's a much smaller amount today, as in a much smaller fraction. A lot more people file sharing in Sweden today. But at that point, I realized that, yeah, a lot of people are getting really demonized here. If only one-fifth of these are just fed up with being painted as bad people, then a new party is going to be in parliament. As in, we can do this. We can, do, we can really do this. I did the math as a project manager. And then it's, it's sort of just like, yeah, that it would probably work, and I didn't think more of it, you know, until December 14, 2005, when something else happened. And that was the passage of the data retention directive in the European Parliament. That was like big walk the fuck letters all over my vision. This was just the software. Um, no, no, no this, was not, this was not software patents. This was, uh, what was the name in. Uh, uh, what's the name in Germany? The Datenschutzverrat, I think. Something for that. So, so, so where, where your, where your f mobile phone, by law, was turned into a governmental tracking device. So, on that day, when I got home from work, I registered the domain pirateparty.se uh, in Swedish, pirateparty.se. I worked over the... Uh, the... Uh, Christmas and New Year's holidays, you set up a really ugly website. I shit you not, it was ugly. Like, I, I can't decide what shit, really. But it worked. Uh, it was, it had the information on there. Mm -hmm. And when it was time to go back to work on December, no, on January 2, it was on the evening of January 1. Okay, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put up, put online whatever I have. I did, and it just blew up. It just snowballed. I, I mean, on January 2, it was in world media. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. I mean, the Pirate Party appeared in many other countries, in Germany and Iceland and where else? Well, it, it depends a little bit on how you count, as in when is something a political party? Is it when you, there's a website? Is it when it's registered? Is it when it's elected and so on? Mm -hmm. But other media s state the number as between 50 and 70 countries. So it's got 50 a pretty, or 70? Yeah, uh, 50 to 70. So it's got a pretty good spread, that's it. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's really impressive. So congratulations oh, for that success. Oh, really, thank you. Really amazing. Thank so you. having success in Parliament is one thing, but having success in society is another thing. Does the Pirate Party have any success within the society as a well? whole? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you're just looking at what we've done in the European Parliament so far, 
for, to start with, we were absolutely instrumental in stopping what's called three strikes in, in, uh, in Europe. And, and that was through the magic of our representative, the Pirate Party representative, being chosen to represent the people in, in uh, negotiations. These negotiations are about in their own, but let's not go there. About what something called the telecom package should, should, be, should look like. And it's important to remember now that it was really this close to the copyright industry being able to shut off entire households from the internet on three accusations, not convictions, but accusations of distribution of the culture and knowledge outside of the distribution monopolies. And uh, everybody does this. So you had all sorts of violations of due process. And this was our first victory, as in we made this illegal. We made that shit illegal throughout Europe. No, no country is getting away with this. Hadoop in France had already started, and we just made that shit illegal. The second thing we did with where we were instrumental was the, uh, the defeat of ACTA. Mm -hmm. As in, there were a lot of groups co cooperating on, uh, on uh, stopping this so-called trade deal, which was really against everything the Net Generation Liberty Movement stands for. But being on the inside of the European Parliament at this time was absolutely crucial. Being able to coordinate with the activist groups outside, having synchronized protests in 200 European cities at the same time, which had never happened. And then being able to be on the inside of Parliament, explaining to the politicians what is all this about in rooms where the lobbyists did not have access. That was absolutely instrumental. So that was a, a major, major win for, for this liberty movement where we were not sufficient, but we were necessary. Yeah, there, there are more victories like this, but we have already made a significant. We have already made world history change course in quite a few significant, uh, significant ways. Yeah, that's really great. That's a great success, and thanks a lot for doing that. <laughs> thanks a lot for your hard work. So, what do you think is the future of the Pirate Party? What What is next? Oh, that's hard to say at this point. I mean, I founded it. But at some point, a child is going to move out of the parental home. Mm -hmm. They choose their own path. They fly on their own wings. And they're going to completely ignore my parental guidance, which is good, because that's <laughs> the way it's supposed to do. But you can observe that the average time for a new party to get its first representative is 23 years. Mm -hmm. We got our first after three and a half years under my leadership in Sweden. And we've been asked to form a government on Iceland after a decade. As in, this is moving way faster than average. So I'm really optimistic that even if it's not the Pirate Party, that the net liberty issues are going to become important policy sooner rather than later. I mean, that was the goal to begin with, to put these issues on the radar, to make the politicians understand that Hey guys, you have a blind spot here. Yeah. Um, like we are here at the an anarchist conference. Um, my question is, um, what role does the government play in your um, in your point of view? Oh wow, that's a big question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> government. Um, well, basically, it's a con continuation of kings and rulers, isn't it? In terms of, we have a democracy on the on the surface, but we're still in the mindset of electing a king. And this is important to realize. What we're doing, or what we're supposed to be doing, is hiring a janitor, hiring an accountant, hiring somebody to take care of managing this boring stuff we don't want to be doing. But we have the mindset of electing a king, and that has to go. Um... Do you have a position on um, on the on the ECB on on the monetary system? <laughs> Do I have an opinion on yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's a Ponzi scheme, inside out. Like the, the, it's been. Um, Well, to, to begin with, our monetary system is not that old. A lot of people think that this monetary system has been around forever. It has not. It's been around since exactly August 15, 1971, 1971 when uh, U.S. President Nixon declared the U.S. in bankruptcy. It wasn't worded like that, but that's the effect of saying that we're not going to pay back our loans. Screw you. Right. 
which which uh, yeah uh, yeah Bretton Woods and um, and the so-called Nixon shock when the or closing the gold window all sorts of words other than just bankruptcy were used at the time so we're living in a 40 year old experiment where everybody could start the money printing presses and print as much money as the presses would tolerate and before they gl were glowing too hot and that's exactly what everybody has been doing and you know this has happened so many times before I like studying history. When you start printing money to get out of governmental debt, the story doesn't have a happy ending anymore. It doesn't. The, the, the tensions are growing. The rubber's gonna snap. It's, gotta be, it's gonna be ugly. Is your party addressing this topic? We're talking a lot about fiscal policy. We also address it more in a practical manner, I would say, by having a lot of activists who understand Bitcoin and crypt cryptocurrency. We use Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which frankly is one of the most subversive, subversive things you can be doing right now, yeah. using value that is not government issued. Yeah, great. Um, because you're from Sweden, for me, it looks like Sweden is even more brainwashed when it comes to the migrant crisis. What's your opinion on the migrant crisis and how, how is the situation in, in Sweden right now? Uh, let's first establish that a lot of people are blaming problems on migrants. I am never going to blame anybody for following economic incentives. Sweden promised gold and green forests and the world to anybody who would just manage to cross the Mediterranean Sea and all kinds of hazards and make it to Sweden. I'm not going to blame anybody for trying their, trying their best of luck. But creating those incentives was, I think, it, headless and, fr and even worse. And this is much worse than creating those incentives in the pr first place, is that all discussion on the subject was actively suppressed. Yeah. As in, when you're not allowed to even discuss facts, observations, science, and try to make evidence-based policymaking, which is kind of a holy word in my book, evidence-fucking-based policymaking. When, that, when the evidence that's supposed to underlie evidence policymaking is not allowed to exist, how are you making policy? Our neighboring countries, Norway and Denmark, had a much healthier debate. And Sweden is just starting to pay the price for not allowing the debate on this. It's not bad to invite guests into your house. It's not bad to be friends with your neighbors. It's not bad to have a big party. But if you're not thinking about how you're going to make ends meet at the end of the month after you paid for this party, you're just being dumb. And that's where Sweden is right now. Sweden has underlying problems. Sweden is running out of other people's money. For the past 50 years or so, Sweden has had the highest taxes in the developed world, give or take, but it's always been one of, the, one of the worst, which has led to a lot of structural problems. Every single public problem uh, in public service has been seen as a lack of resources. So government has been throwing tax money at everybody who has been incompetent. And when you're rewarding incompetence for 50 years straight, institutions take notice and shape from the incentives given. The problem is not the migrant crisis. The problem is not migrants who are following their self-interest. I applaud people following their self-interest. I'm an ANCAP. I love self-interest. The problem is that Sweden has run out of other people's money. Actually, um, <clears throat> I think many people, when they think about Sweden, and think it's a perfect example for a good welfare state. But actually, from my point of view, it's like Sweden just lives off from the economic freedom they had like 50 years ago. And yes. now the welfare state That's just exactly. got bigger and bigger. The welfare state is a Ponzi scheme. The, low, the lowest rung of the ladder never had, had any welfare state. And at the end of the day, they, they were screwed out of it. It's always been said that everybody's going to be have this lovely safety net. It's not. If you're if you're part of a Ponzi scheme, you'd better not be the last guy into the pyramid. Okay. Thank you very much for the interview, Rick.